Okay, let me show you one special case. So um, imagine, let's just take this problem and we'll, we'll work it. You could possibly see this on the test. But let's imagine we have this problem where the lenses are just a lot closer together. If you don't see this in this class, you'll see it in the lab. Um, but you could see it in this class. Let's say instead of being separated by 60 centimeters as they are here, let's say that the two lenses are just separated by 10 centimeters. So I have lens one here, and I have lens two here, and they're just separated by 10 centimeters. Okay. Now, if we look back up here, our first image was actually 20 centimeters to the right of the first lens. So that means that my first image is going to be right here. That this value will be Q1 which was equal to 20 centimeters. All right, so remember we said way back, I don't know, a few days ago, that if we have an object that is on that side, the far side of the lens, then it becomes a negative object distance. And then I said, don't worry about that because we won't see that until we get to two lens systems. This is where you get what we call a virtual object. So in this case, this becomes a virtual object. And because it's a virtual object, it has a negative value for P. So uh, our P value for P2, P2, this distance is 10 centimeters, 20 minus 10. So it's going to have an object distance of negative 10 centimeters. Now follow me on that. We move our lenses really close together. And then that first image that's created by the first lens, instead of being in between the lenses, it actually goes to the right of the second lens. And then that becomes a virtual object. Because we've been sort of dealing with these ideas that if I have a lens, if it's on this side, this is the real side. If it's on this side, this is the virtual side. As my rays travel in this direction from left to right, but now we have our object on the virtual side of the lens. Okay, so it's a virtual object. And anytime you have a virtual image or a virtual object, it's going to have a negative value for its distance, either its object or its image distance. Okay? So let's see how this would work out. If P was equal to negative 10, then I would have uh, to find Q2. It would be 1 over F2 minus 1 over P2. The inverse of that, that would be 1 over 20 minus 1 over negative 10. Inverse, let's see, that's 1 over 20 plus 2 over 20. That's going to be 20 divided by 3, which is about what, uh, is that 6 and 2 thirds? So 6.7 centimeters. And then that's our, our image distance. So that image is 6.7 centimeters to the right of the second lens. You treat it exactly the same when your image, when your first image is to the right of the second lens, except that image now becomes a virtual, excuse me, that object now becomes a virtual object. You make your P negative. Yeah, Tom? The, the final one, you know, that it's 6.7 to the right, is that now back to a real image? Yeah, it's going to be a real image now. Uh, well, I said that it was to the right because this came out positive. And if, remember, if Q is ever positive, that's always a real image. And so that's why it's to the right. So again, we sort of have this real space on this side, virtual space on this side, as we always assume that our light rays are traveling in this direction. Now, if you see this elsewhere, we'll always have our light rays travel from left to right. But if you see it drawn the other way, when they travel from right to left, then the real and virtual space just sort of switch. So for example here, we're always assuming that our light rays are traveling in this direction. All right, whereas if we had our light rays traveling in this direction, then the spaces would just switch. Then we would have uh, real on this side, virtual on this side. Don't write this down. Just If you see this elsewhere, you could, you're not going to see it in this class, but if you see it, like, I don't know, whatever standardized test you take or whatever, another class. OK? Is that exciting? I look a little bit excited about it. Yeah. These are pretty easy. They're just like single-end systems, except you just do them back-to-back. -back. 
And then make sure you get your sign convention right. Okay. So, for like the problem that we worked out with like, taking the one, would both of those objects be virtual since they're on the left and the right side? Would both of the objects be, those images be virtual since they're on the left side? I got that problem with the only word. The one in the quick test. Mm -hmm. No, both of these are real objects. I know they're both real objects because. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, you said, like, this side is real and that side is virtual, and the image is on that side, and then somehow that one's the opposite of the side. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got that mixed up. Uh, Let's rewind about four minutes. Can we rewind about four <laughs> minutes? Is that okay? And just take back everything? If Q comes out positive, it's a real image. And so here, Q came out positive. It is a real image. I'm so sorry. I just confused you, I know. If I can put a screen here, I can put a screen here and catch this image. I can actually see it on the, uh, on the screen. If I put a screen right here, I can see this image. But if I have an image like back here somewhere, I can't see that image on a screen. So is that sub virtual and sub real? Yeah, except if your if your object is on the opposite side, it becomes virtual. Okay. So they're not both real because the Q is positive. They're both real because the Q is positive. They are both real because Q is positive. Okay. Thank you, Abby. I'm sorry. Okay. Are y'all? Adequately confused now. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's move on to aberrations. It's really a lot easier than making it out to be. Okay, so we have a couple different aberrations. You just need to know what causes the aberrations, what's the effect of it, and where do we see them. So for spherical lenses and mirrors, rays at the uh, at the outer edge focus at different points. Focus at different focal lengths, rather. So if we have light rays that come into the middle part of the lens, they're going to focus at the focal point right there. But when we have spherical lenses and spherical mirrors, when we have rays that come in the outer part of the lens here, they're going to focus at a different focal point. This difference is called the difference in these focal points. This is called our spherical aberration. You're not going to have any uh, calculations associated with this, though in the lab you do have to actually determine what is the spherical aberration for a, a particular lens, where you just measure the different focal points. But I want you to know what, what it is and how to fix it. Uh, this also occurs in mirrors. It can be it can be small. Like I think in the lab when y'all do this, you use these you know like 15 centimeter focal length lenses, and you come up with maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 centimeters. So that's a 10 percent change almost in the focal point. It occurs in mirrors too. It's a little bit different, but I have light rays that come into the middle part of the mirror, and they focus right here. And then I can also have light rays that come into the outer parts of the mirror, and they will focus at a slightly different point, say right there. And that's also called the spherical aberration. So remember, this also occurs in mirrors uh, because it's really only related to the geometry of the, of the device. Two different ways you can get rid of this. Can I go down from here? Okay. Two different ways you can get rid of it, which you need to be aware of. Uh, for a system of optics, you can correct these by adding a uh, diverging lens, or just by adding other lenses. Before or after the lens, For mirrors, a parabolic mirror does not exhibit these spherical aberrations. And telescopes usually use parabolic mirrors. For their primary mirror. 
They can also use spherical mirrors, but they'll just correct for the spherical aberration in their software. But they often use parabolic mirrors. This is an exaggerated parabolic mirror. They're not this parabolic, but uh, if I have light rays that come in to the center, they focus at a certain point, say right there. And if I have light rays that come into the outer edges, they will focus also at the same point. So parabolic mirrors don't exhibit this. Now another way, I know I said there are only two ways, but there are actually a couple different ways is for lenses. The most common way to get rid of spherical aberrations for lenses, you know, imagine you have this lens, you have these rays that come in to the middle part, they focus here, and then you have them come here. One of the most common ways to get rid of this is just to take an aperture and put it right there and to block all but the inner part of the lens. So another way to remove spherical aberrations or to minimize them at least use an aperture. To block the outer parts of the lens. So three different ways, uh, two for lenses and one for mirrors, although you can do that. You can do this latter part for mirrors, but it's most commonly in cameras and we use lenses to block the outer parts of the lens. Uh, you can use a system of, of lenses. Usually they put a diverging lens in front of the converging lens, and then that eliminates the spherical aberration. You can use an aperture, or for mirrors, you can use a, a parabolic mirror. Okay, uh, there's another aberration called chromatic aberrations. May I go down from here? Okay, what does chromatic mean? Chromatic refers to color, right? So chromatic refers to color. Um, and so this is going to have to do with the color of the light. Chromatic aberrations occur because the index of refraction dependent upon wavelength. And we looked at this earlier, how, uh, I forget what the relationship was, but if I look at N versus wavelength, I can think it looks like this, that as the wavelength increased, the index also, is, the index decreased. So light of different wavelengths that enter a lens at the same position, or as you know, wavelength also refers to color. Uh, that enter a lens at the same position will focus at a different point or at a different focal point. Uh, this aberration only occurs in what? Lenses or mirrors? In lenses, right? Uh, the reason is is that in mirrors you don't have any refraction and so this only occurs in things where refraction occurs which are only in lenses. So since no refraction occurs in mirrors, so let's see, I have uh, say blue light and red light. They both come say to the outer parts of the lens. And because I'm going to have different indices of refraction, let's see how's it going to look. Uh, if n decreases as lambda increases, the red is going to bend, what, more or less? Red has a shorter or longer wavelength than blue? It has a longer wavelength than blue light. And so if this is true, what is it going to do? Does it have a bigger or smaller index of refraction, red light? has a smaller index of refraction, so that will cause it to bend more or less? Less, right. So the smaller index of refraction, closer to one, will cause the red light to bend less. So we'll get something like this, that the red light will go out here, and the blue light will bend more. And we'll get different uh, focal points. What this means is that you're going to get sort of the red part of your image out here, and the blue part of your image out here. In practice, then, you'll just get a fuzzy image. But the colors won't really mix up, right? And you'll just get a fuzzy image. So that's called chromatic aberrations. 
Uh, let's see, let's try this little quick test. You'll just have, I don't know, two or three multiple choice questions about these. Uh, what causes them? What are they relevant to? How can you fix them? Uh, to fix this, see, I don't, I don't have a system. We'll not worry about how to fix this, but how to fix the, uh, the spherical aberrations. All right, let's try this. What's the purpose of the aperture? We'll stop at, uh, say, 35. 35, just guess if you're not sure. Okay, awesome. A is right. Uh, we use this to re reduce the effects of spherical aberration. Well, let's go and do this next one. Uh, lenses experience which of these aberrations? Spherical or chromatic or both? I'll stop at 25, 25. Awesome, C is right. Uh, lenses experience both spherical and chromatic. Mirrors, on the other hand, only experience which of those? Only spherical, because of the spherical geometry, and they don't have refraction. Um, what did the blanket say when it fell off of the bed? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Sorry if you're offended. A potty language here. 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Um, yeah, I like that one too. Okay. So go through the homework. Again, uh, we've already done a lot of the homework for, for the previous test. But make sure you go through the homework. You can do the ray diagrams, but as I said before, we're not really concerned too much that you can draw the rays. Though you'll likely have a question about where I just draw rays and ask you which is correct or incorrect. But as I told you in class, it's not going to be one of the more difficult ones. It'll be like, you know, the convex lens outside the focal point or something like that, or maybe at the focal point where there's no image. Uh, not the concave lens or the convex lens inside the focal point. Those are kind of tricky. Right, those are more tricky than the other two. Uh, where you have all the virtual rays, you're dealing with virtual rays. Okay, um, but it will help you to know the ray diagrams just because it helps you to know what types of images are formed by what types of lenses. Uh, did we finish the concept tests in the back for this chapter? Seriously. Yeah, we just said 7.9. Great. Was it, was it an important oh, question? Did I already skip it? Okay, let's try this one. Curved mirror surface can have what? Didn't we just do this? Okay. Okay. Um, I'll stop at 25. Okay, it's not spherical and chromatic because mirrors don't experience refraction. So they don't experience the chromatic aberration. It's uh, only spherical aberrations. We did this one right. Oh, this is the one? Yeah, we're not going to worry about it. That was really from the last. It's kind of goofy anyway. Okay, uh, it is E if you want to write it down. but. That was really from the previous test. Okay. Uh, any questions about this chapter?
Remember, we're, everything lenses on the next test. So we picked up with lenses, you'll see lens equation. It'll be a lot like the last test, except we'll be dealing with lenses. Be careful with some of the signs are a little bit different. The names of the lenses are different, right? Convex, concave, diverging, converging. Make sure you're up on that. Work through the homework. It's kind of nice to have this separated from the mirrors because they are just a little bit different, but a lot the same. OK? All right, well, let's carry on with chapter eight. We just have two more chapters, and they're both pretty short. And you know, honestly, this will probably be the easiest test of the entire semester. So I really I want to see some great grades on this upcoming exam. That doesn't mean it'll be easy, as, as you know, but it'll be, I think, probably the, the least difficult of all the four exams. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the wave nature of light. Um, we've sort of already talked about this. This is a property of all waves, all types of waves. You can have uh, like water waves, mechanical waves, as we'll see in the next chapter, sound waves, and we'll also see that it occurs with light waves as well. Light waves. Uh, it occurs when two or more waves come together. And we can have two different types of interference. We can have constructive interference. Occurs when the, uh, the peaks of a wave line up with the peaks of another wave. These are sometimes called crests, like the crest on a wave, uh, peaks, whatever, the, the high point of the wave. Uh, we then call these two waves to be in phase. And we'll look at all the different ways that waves can be in phase or out of phase in just a bit. So when I have constructive interference, I can have these two waves come together. And they basically, when our peaks add up like this, they produce a wave with the same wavelength but a larger amplitude. Um, we'll talk about wavelength a bit. Let me just tell you right now, though. The wavelength is the distance from here to here. It's the distance for one full oscillation. We'll see that in just a bit. So here, when I put these two waves together, when the peaks and the peaks line up, I'll just get a wave with a larger amplitude. You've seen this. Uh, if you have boats that come across one another out on a lake, and then their waves come together, they produce a bigger wave. They can also produce a wave that completely goes away, but you don't usually see that on a lake because it's just kind of difficult to get that kind of interference. Um, let's watch a little video. This is from The Frozen Planet. You ever seen that series? I think it was BBC put it out. Uh, it shows some uh, killer whales as they're hunting. They're hunting some seals. Uh, if you really like animals a lot, I, just to give you a little warning, it doesn't end well for the seal. But these, these killer whales, they, they have this technique where they work together to create water waves, and they basically cause the waves to interfere with one another. I think that's kind of cool that they use this technique to, to create these really big waves when they hunt these seals. Okay? Are you ready to watch it? It's a few minutes long. It's probably longer than it needs to be, but I think it's kind of a fun video. Maybe fun is not the right word, but it's an interesting video. Okay? So let's watch and think about the waves and how they add up and uh, how these killer whales use and Hey, everybody's got to eat, you know? Killer whales, too. What? Oh, sorry. Okay, so anyway, that's constructive interference. With, and it occurs in all types of waves. It occurs in sound waves, uh, mechanical waves, water waves, like with the seals. And we'll see that it also occurs with light. Uh, remember, back when we were talking about whether light is a wave or a particle, if you recall, uh, Thomas Young said that light was a wave because of this property of interference. So he, he found that, that light interfered with itself and caused, uh, caused him to believe that light was a wave. You can also have destructive interference. That occurs when the peaks of a wave line up with the troughs of another wave. Destructive interference. Occurs when the peaks of a wave line up with the troughs of another wave. We then call the two waves to be um, out of phase.
So here, if I have these two waves come together, where I have the peak lining up with the trough, if I put those waves together, I get a wave that is completely gone. And that's called destructive interference. Now, for interference to occur in light waves, we have to have two criteria that are met. First, the two waves have to have identical wavelengths. And this is, I already showed you what the distance is, what that wavelength is, but it's the distance for the, uh, for one full cycle in the wave. So we're going to take in this wave, go one full cycle. So for example, if I start here, one full cycle would go to here. Because at this point I was going up, and at this point I'm also going up. It's going to be one full cycle. I'll draw that on the picture here in just a second. If I'm going here, one full cycle comes back up to here because I'm going down, I'm going down. Say I start right here, one full cycle takes me over to here. So you go through that point twice to get back to where one full wavelength is. Let me show you on this picture. So we can measure our wavelength from any point, say from here to here. My wavelength from here to here, peak to peak, R trough to trough. That's the easy way. Uh, R some other point, say for example, uh, here to here. Those are all one wavelength. And in order for this interference to occur, your two waves, your two light waves, have to have identical wavelengths. Uh, also, the light sources must be coherent. And in order to describe that, let's describe what phase is. Uh, the phase of a wave describes the positions of the waves um, as they're in relation to one another. So for example, if I have two waves like I have here, I call it, I'd say that these two waves are in phase, where the peaks, like my fingers and my peaks, they line up together. So these two are in phase when the peaks and the peaks line up together. The phase describes how are these different. So if they're in phase, I would say, well, they're zero degrees out of phase. right? They're not out of phase at all. But if they're offset like this, then I would say that these two waves are out of phase. Let me write this down first. So first of all, these two waves are said to be out of phase These are in phase right here. That is, they're not out of phase at all. Okay? Here, these two waves, this is referring to these two down here, these two waves are said to be out of phase by one wavelength. Because my first wave starts, it goes through its cycles, and then the second wave starts at a point that is one full wavelength past the beginning of where this first wave started. Okay, so this wave starts, and then one full wavelength later, the second wave starts. Now these two waves are said to be out of phase by one wavelength. Uh, these waves are also in phase. That is that the peaks still line up with the peaks, and the troughs still line up with the troughs. But we would, all, we would usually say that these two waves are 360 degrees out of phase. All right? Whereas up here, we would say that these are zero degrees out of phase. Y'all see this? They still give you constructive interference, but because one is offset by a wavelength, then we say that it's, it's either zero degrees out of phase when it's not offset, or 360 degrees out of phase when it is offset. Okay? Well, see ya. I can have different waves that are offset by other amounts. So for example here, these two waves, if they're offset by a half wavelength, they're said to be out of phase by a half wavelength.
Notice that these are destructive interference. Or, I'm sorry, that they are completely out of phase. And we would say that these two waves are, well, what do you think? If not being offset at all was zero degrees and being offset by a full wavelength was 360 degrees, how many degrees are these two waves going to be offset by? 180. Right. So these are going to be 180 degrees out of phase. Sometimes you see this referred to not in degrees but in radians, but we'll just deal in degrees up here. So you could see this not as 180 degrees out of phase, but pi radians out of phase, that you have a pi phase shift. Um, again, these have destructive interference because my peaks line up with my troughs. They're completely out of phase. We would say that they're 180 degrees out of phase. And then finally, we have one other example, and that's when they're a quarter wavelength out of phase. Uh, these two waves are out of phase by one quarter wavelength. And here we don't get interference. We don't get a complete destructive interference. But we don't get complete constructive interference either. Instead, we get some combination of that. So if I were to look, you know, if you have constructive interference where the waves look like this, they add up to give you something with a bigger amplitude. If I have destructive interference, they give you something that gives you no amplitude at all. Here, if you were to add these two waves, it would be something funky, some sort of function that would be some combination of those two waves. We'll look at that with regards to sound in the next chapter, because it'll be similar. We'll have a similar thing. And we'll say that these two waves are, well, gosh, what do you think? Not offset at all was zero degrees. Offset by one full wavelength was, what, 360 degrees? Offset by a half wavelength was, what was a half wavelength? 180. So what do you think a quarter wavelength is going to be? 90 degrees. You might get into this in calculus. I'm not sure. Y'all talk about phase shift and stuff like that in Calc. Probably not in Calc 1. Do you? Talk, ever talk about phase in Calc 1? Do you? Okay. So these are offset. Uh, these waves are uh, 90 degrees out of phase. And you get neither destructive nor constructive. You get something in between. Uh, so for two waves to be coherent, remember that was, we were getting back to this idea of coherent. It means that the waves are neither um, in phase, are either in phase nor out of phase. It just means that their phases remain constant. So they're neither in phase nor out of phase. If you're incoherent, they can either be in phase or they can be completely out of phase. That doesn't really matter. What's really important is that the phase remains constant. That as those two waves travel through space, their phase doesn't shift around. And that's not really the case with the light like we get from in a natural setting from the sun or from the fluorescent or whatever. The phase of these waves is constantly shifting because of the processes that cause them. These waves are constantly shifting back and forth in phase space. So in order to, to observe destructive or constructive interference, we have to have waves that are coherent and their phase remains constant. So when we talk about a wave being coherent, it really means that the, the phase of that wave remains constant in time. Uh, let's see, we're going to come back and do this FET thing in just a little bit. Let's try this quick test. Consider these two waves. What type of interference occurs when the two waves combine?
Go ahead and do the next one. If you've already finished this, I'll stop at uh, 35. 35. Okay, good. A is right. Let's try the next one. You can have all different types of waveforms. In the lab, you can create any kind of waveform you want. Uh, what if you have these two waves and you add them up? What kind of, which of the choices represents their interference pattern? If I have these two waves, what does their interference pattern look like? All right, I'll stop at uh, 38, 38. Uh, I think that's right. Let's see. So these two parts are going to destructively interfere, so they'll just go away completely. Uh, these two parts are going to constructively interfere, so I'll get something that looks like this, or like this, or like this, right? And then over here, it's a little more complicated. This part destructively interferes with that part. These two parts constructively interfere. And then these two parts cancel out. So I'm going to get, uh, what was the right answer? A, right? Yeah, I'm going to get A. Is that what I marked? Yeah. OK. So be able to take a waveform and just figure out how do these interfere with one another whether it's a sinusoidal form like in the previous one or something like this that is not typical. See, I'll give you a joke and I'll let you go. You don't want to hear a joke? Or you just want to go? Yeah, let's hear a joke. So this one's pretty good, actually. Okay, can y'all just wait? Okay. So uh, helium atom walks into a bar and the bartender says, hey, we don't serve noble gases here. Helium doesn't forget. <laughs> All right, have a great day. I'll see you uh, Wednesday, and we'll do this next question.